Welcome back, hockey fans. This is episode 109 in the Clappercast. I'm Burke, as always, joined by Sean. Sean, what's going on today? Uh, we're just sitting here kind of, uh, you know, wondering how Jack Hughes feels right about now. He's back in the lineup for the first time in a while, and he signed a massive contract. A massive second deal here. Yeah, he's probably pretty stoked. Um, a lot to live up to now. Um, I mean, it was, what, an 8x8? Yes. Eight eight? Yeah, Jack Hughes got an 8x8 eight seem- eight deal. Yeah, it seems a little, a little steep. Uh, given you know how much he's actually I mean, played and <laughs> how he's only had like <laughs> you know a little bit of success so far, I know there's a lot of I mean, hype career, for him, but yeah, his career 55 points in 119 games, his you know in air quotes breakout season of 31 points in 56 games, and then this year he's only played t- it's his third season he's played two games and has three points, and then got hurt. Yeah, so. Yeah, that seems like a lot of money to be thrown around for for that level of success so far, but obviously they're banking on him getting yeah. better and better and better and it being a bargain eventually. But yeah, so like chances are we've you know, what we've seen of him and how he developed into his second season, chances are he'll be fine. It'll it'll you know, it'll play out quite well. Um I, I mentioned this to you right after I saw that, that it reminded me of that Leon Dreisidel contract. That was like eight million or whatever his second her eight million dollar contract before he had really done a whole lot. He had that one good season, got a huge deal, and everyone's like, "Wow, he's overpaid. That's way too much." You know, similar similar idea to this to that one, I think. Yeah, I guess they're just hoping on a similar development path as you know one of the best players in the league, Leon Dreisaitl, which is I don't <laughs> know if that's a successful way to run your. Your that might be a salary cap or not, but yeah, I don't know. It's a lot to 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 bank on players' development path, especially just after getting hurt and missing some time, and just a, a very small sample size. So I don't know. It it feels like it's probably going to end up being okay, but for right now, that's a lot of risk. Um, so I don't know. I guess the the Devils are kind of you know the they're developing a new core and they're they're you know they want to attract talent and so that's one way to do it i i don't know we'll see it's really early to tell on that i don't know if he's even i guess their game has just started not that long ago as a time of recording this um but we'll see (laughs) i mean even the rest of this season how does how's it gonna look um is it a deal or is it not so yeah because like i don't know you, you know this is his second contract he's coming out this is gonna be in effect next season and he's going to be entering his second contract, like right out of his entry entry level deal. Yeah, so locking him up long term is is good, but um, you know that that AAV could could end up biting them if he doesn't quite develop how everyone kind of anticipates right now. Um, so yeah. so we'll, you know keep an eye on it. But like I said, the dev- Devils have a sort of a new core right now, so we'll we'll see how it turns out for them. But he's definitely you know, a key to their success and they see it that way and they want to, you know, lock them up. And if that's what it took, I guess, you know, they're able to make a deal there. Um, you know, some, some other big news, not of the day, but kind of of the week here is that, uh, you know, the Montreal Canadiens fired their general manager, uh, Mark Bergevin. Um, so I guess they weren't going to be intimidated by his physical presence and they probably fired him over zoom <laughs> i would imagine <laughs> yeah there's no way jeff wilson's having that conversation in person he's gonna get a, a safe distance between the two of them first <laughs> <laughs> i mean in all honesty it probably did happen in person that seems like that's the sort of thing that would happen but i wouldn't blame him if yeah. it was remote because bergevin is just <laughs> fucking swole and jacked so um but yeah i mean like it was kind of a, a, a bit of a surprise at just how fast things happened i think but um yeah. you would have thought that after the cinderella run last season he would have bought himself at least the year and it's also kind of a weird one like knowing the situation the habs are in where they're kind of been they've been hit hard by injuries and you know players leaving and stuff um for it to happen so quickly and mid-season and you know what what are they hoping to accomplish by making this move in the middle of the season like that yeah it seems very like i get i think it just seems very reactionary like yeah. is it really bergevin's fault that they're this bad right now like 
like you mentioned, they've had injuries and players leaving the team. You, you know, it's it's kind of funny because it's like, is Price's absence one of the main reasons they're not winning games? It it could be. Um, Bergevin granted him the the leave of absence, and then the first thing that Molson does in this announcement is to say that we're to, we're adding in mental health as part of our, you know, our medical staff. So it's like, yeah, okay. So are you f- is but did that did that factor into your decision to fire Bergevin that he w- like granted Carey Price that right? I don't know. It just seems kind of weird that way. But um, you know, like Hoffman's been out. Shea Weber obviously out, Price out, um, Petrie majorly underperforming, Caulfield struggling, like Suzuki struggling. Everyone's struggling. Players are out. Like it's, it's yeah, hard it's to play to place it solely on Bergevin. However, this isn't a move that is like completely out of nowhere, as it's been kind of talked about for a few seasons. I feel that's like, oh, when you know, is is Bergevin's last season? Is this his last chance? And you know, we, we heard about it last year, too, and I remember joking with you during the playoffs that um, Bergevin would go down onto the bench after the series wins and congratulate the players, but he'd also be there saying, like, thanks for saving my job. Yeah. Because, like, it was it was that close where he was kind of running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it just seems like a weird time for me. Like, I know that they're losing and, you know, something's got to give, but ultimately I think the team that they're icing, like, it, it should be good on paper, but... um like better than they are on paper. They look better on paper than they do in the standings. Um, but I don't. I don't think that where they're at in the standings is the fault of Bergevin. I think he's done a pretty good job of bringing in players and you know drafting and everything. And so I, I don't know. Like I don't. I don't really know how much better they're gonna get in the short term as a result of a new general manager. Um, I don't know. I think he's done a pr- pretty okay job of you know asset management and, and i don't know rebuilding yeah ultimately because if you look at the prospect pool the draft picks been developed and like the age and the of the of the players of the core and it's it's a solid up-and-coming team where a lot of the best a lot of good players like romanov suzuki paling caulfield like they're all still young and developing and progressing so that's like a that's a pretty good core to build around at this point yeah and i i just i don't know I mean, you see, like, some of the players, like, um, Brennan Gallagher, just, like, what his relationship was with Mark Bergevin. You know, he had, like, Bergevin, like, crying when he re-signed him, and then, like, uh, just this week, like, Gallagher was saying, like, not many guys would have taken a chance on, you know, like, a later round pick and an undersized forward and given him a chance and made him such a big part of the team. And, yeah, it's... um, it's interesting because I think that this is a guy that did a, a pretty good job given the circumstances. You know, you've got like mm-hmm. Hoffman out, Edmondson out, you know, Matthew Perot, Weber, Paul Byron out, Carey Price out. Like, yeah, the team is going to be worse <laughs> than it than it would have been. Of course, because um, this is a lot of their depth. I mean, <laughs> that, that's a lot of their better depth players. Yeah, and some other their their captain and their their best player in Carey Price. Yeah, like, it's like okay, exactly. so, so so I don't know who's after... gonna be able to do it to right the ship here. Like it's I don't think yeah. it's the general manager's fault, but and yeah. what there even really is to write unless they just want to a, diff- a slightly different direction to get them to the next level of success. Yeah, and like like you mentioned about that story with Gallagher, it see like it seems like Bergevin's got a pretty good relationship with you know the the team, the players. It's like that. You know that could end up having a bit of an impact on, on the players themselves, and you know, the the locker room and the mentality around there. Yeah, and you know, like anytime anyone gets fired in any job, it's like you know, there's probably a lot of things that we don't see that that uh, resulted in this decision from ownership. You know, it's like maybe Bergevin had a very very different vision for where this team should be going, and maybe he wanted to, you know, ride out this losing streak and see if they could get some some draft picks or something you know they 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 did trade away their first but they got they have carolinas um you know they've got a lot of picks so maybe he wanted to just kind of keep it going and then maybe molson said no you know what this is montreal we want to be competitive every season and you know fill fill up the arena blah 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 
Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's just like a clash there. They've just been there for too long, and it's just time for a change. Who knows? But to me, it's kind of those ones where it's like it's not not really doing the worst job. <laughs> I don't know why you want to fire him. So you know the the search kind of begins for um, a bilingual, you know, francophone t- to take take that general management role. But uh, they brought in Jeff yeah. Gordon as vice president of uh, hockey operations. Um, to, to kind of take take the wheel right now, um, and then there's some interesting candidates so far for for who might <laughs> take that job. <laughs> <laughs> we see, yeah, you know, we saw Patrick Wash shooting his shot earlier today. Um, I don't know where exactly the quote was. You sent it to me on Instagram, but I don't know where you where the quote was originating from. But he said something along the lines of, um, you know, yeah, give me a shot, see what I can do. Yeah, why not? You know, what's the worst? What do you have to lose? It's like. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I guess it, so. It you could... know, we get uh, Patrick Waugh in there. That'd be an, that'd be an interesting, an interesting return to the organization. <laughs> yeah, and then I've also seen like you know Daniel Briere. Um, I think there's been a few other like f- you know f- francophone p- ex players that th- their names have been tossed around. Yeah. So. We'll so see. an interesting thing that I had seen, I can't remember who speculated on this one, is that. The team brought Jeff Gorton in to be the general manager, to be like a, you know, leading in that role or overseeing that role. But because of their internal rule on, you know, having a bilingual francophone GM, um, they brought Gorton in as the president of hockey operations to put like a figurehead GM in place to work with Gorton on building the team. Yeah, so they can uh, probably bring in someone with a little less experience and title general manager, but they're effectively assistant general manager and just get some experience, which is where you see a lot of those ex players. who might not have the managerial experience quite yet, but they've either got a good reputation in the community or they kind of fit. They tick enough of the boxes for the Habs to bring them in and give them a shot as, you know, GM working with someone like Jeff Gordon, who we've talked about before. Like he's got a very good track record of, uh, of putting teams over the hump into getting them competitive or, fast tracking rebuilds getting skilled players in places to help them succeed so that's yeah, uh, bringing bringing gordon yeah. in is a very good move for the montreal canadians yeah he definitely did some good work and rain for the rangers in a short amount of time and i think if they can get someone in that quote unquote general manager role who is like almost like a fan favorite just win some like you know some some fan points back and just gets get a positive out of this season so far you know that could have a very dramatic effect. So, um, I don't know who that candidate would be, but you know, someone who people like and are excited about. I don't think Patrick Waugh would be a good good one, um, but <laughs> maybe not you know. yet. He's yeah, got the coaching experience, but let him get some management experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unless so. he's doing some of that in the juniors, I don't know what his actual title is. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's a lot of francophone people in, involved in you know either minor or uh, junior hockey or hockey canada or um you know other teams around the, the league that are looking for you know an opportunity to work in quebec who who doesn't want to work for you know the montreal canadians you know that's probably a childhood dream so um there's probably a lot of people who are interested in that role um and especially yeah. if they can kind of make it a duo role where you're not the only person making decisions it kind of takes some of the pressure off as well if there's a someone beside you doing the same thing or with the same yeah absolutely um so yeah that was probably one of the the, the bigger storylines and you know we'll keep it original six here for a moment and then talk about you know all of Habs fans favorite person Brad Marchand um he was suspended for three games for for his slew foot on uh Oliver Ekman Larson against the Canucks. Um, I, it, it's interesting to me to see a three-game suspension for that. It was a, it was a dangerous play. You know, Marchand obviously got um, a bit of a storied past. I don't know if he's quote unquote a repeat offender because it might have been a while since his last one. But um, we've been seeing a lot of slew foots this season, and this is I think the first one to get suspended. Yeah, I think the others have just been fines. I think Subban's only been fined like seven times for it, right? Yeah, PK Subban, he's been slew foot and like <laughs> left, right, and center 
it's pretty crazy <laughs> how much he's been I doing can't remember it. who said this um i can't remember who said this but i saw someone say it's like it's basically a response to someone who's losing their ed- who's losing their speed and who's just falling behind the game is like you're just slew footing people to keep yourself relevant because you just can't keep up with the game as you as you should be able to or as he used to be it able could to be yeah it's it's weird though because like you see the plays and it's not like he's like trying to catch up to someone or anything it's like he got reeves in the corner and then he got lucic like almost in the corner which was a bad one and then he got uh the blay one i don't think was quite really a slew foot i think it was more just an unfortunate kind of bump uh, but still you know because he's been slew footing almost every single person it's like was that intentional or not but you know he's definitely you know public enemy number one <laughs> in new york or in madison square yeah. garden at least um so it's kind of funny when the rangers play the devils because it's just everyone boos suban um but yeah i mean getting back to the marchand one it's like you know in a vacuum yeah i agree that that's a suspendable play but it's interesting because there's been a bunch of other slew foots that haven't been suspended um yeah. so it's just interesting now to does see this Marchand one go back to yeah does it go does it play back on Marshawn's history because he's been punished for slew footing before hasn't he that used to be his thing yeah i mean i remember like the low bridge he did and and like um he's done a few yeah, other things taking... i don't i just yeah. not sure how long it's been since his last one but it probably comes into play i would imagine um and, yeah, and like, also loses the benefit of the doubt yeah and speaking of marchand it's you know he also got a glove thrown at him by by the rangers um <laughs> so the rangers hate everybody <laughs> uh, by artemi panarin which was funny as hell it's up there with the 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 helmet throw for McKinnon and Garland last season. I, it was so funny. <laughs> yeah. Yep, Love it. It absolutely is. It's a great clip. If you haven't seen it yet, um, Panarin throwing his glove over at Marchand. Um, you know, they're between they're they're both on the bench. So they're, they're throwing it or he threw it from the Rangers bench over to the Bruins bench, uh, right over like the, on the ice reporter. <laughs> oh, so good. <laughs> Love it. It's so funny. Cause it's like, it, obviously that's not going to hurt no matter how hard you throw it. Like, it's just not going to hurt. So it's just so funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, let's no. love it. Um, So, yeah, that was, uh, I don't know. I, like I said, I agree with the suspension. It just, yeah, you know, the Marchand being Marchand. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, to actually comment on the suspension and the play itself, like, he takes out Ekman Larson. Um, he does that, you know, it's typical slew foot setup where you've got your leg is behind Ekman Larson's legs and you hit him and try and take him out with that that motion um they're kind of heading towards the boards ekman larson lands on his back and falls into the board so of course it's like a dangerous play dangerous situation dangerous spot yeah and it's a much smaller man going after a bigger man and it's an easy way to take him out right so exactly um yeah and uh you know sticking with the bruins here we've also got um you know jake debrusque uh had a uh he's gone public with the trade request um, yeah, so, so this is something that's been rumored or talked about for a season at least, or maybe a couple seasons, because DeBrusque has really struggled lately in Boston, going back to most of last season, if not the year before. Um, again, he started out okay, but he's not doing well in Boston again. I'm pretty sure he's demoted right down the lineup again. So obviously it's time for a fresh start for him, and now it's a public trade request that I saw earlier. A lot of teams are interested in now that it's public. Yeah, apparently there's like eight teams that are that are in on him already. Um, yeah, and you know, I like I just quick Google and it's like, you know, should the Oilers trade for Edmonton native Jake DeBrusque? And then it's got a bunch well, of other teams. Well, that's that's that the are, thing that is interested. Edmonton. Edmonton has been like a popular destination for a Jake DeBrusque trade since this all started because of the the ties to Edmonton with Louis DeBrusque because of his you know native. Na- um, Edmonton native. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, is there a place for him on that team? Or I don't know if you're the Oilers, it's like you guys are rolling pretty good. Do you want to make a change? Like with a pretty streaky up and down inconsistent forward. Depends on what they're going to have to give up for him because ultimately DeBrusque is going to be a depth player third, probably third line. But you know, do they, 
do they like Jake DeBrus more than they like Zach Cassian? Because that's essentially the role that's going to be replaced. And, you know, how much are they going to have to give up for him? Because he struggled for quite a while now. Like, how is that going to affect the price? Because you don't want to give up too much for someone who's really not being able to find his game for a while. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think for the Oilers, you just kind of keep rolling. Like, I don't think you make a change. But, like, yeah, I guess, like you said, it depends on the cost. Like, I don't know. How does a guy like Turris fit in <laughs> with the Oilers? Do you think, think that um, – the, the Bruins he's with become like their a coach's issue. favorite for a while hmm. I don't think yeah. Turris has done much of anything this season he got a couple of goals but um, he hasn't done anything to earn a consistent place in the lineup he's still getting pushed out by Ryan McLeod and whatever random winger they have that week yeah honestly like especially after that thing with like Gretzky and like him meeting with like you know, McDavid, Nurse, and um, Dreisaitl for, like, lunch or something, and he was just talking about how, like, cohesive a group the whole team was and everything. I don't think you bring somebody else in right now. Like, I just I just think you just keep rolling and it's like, don't trade out yeah. someone because it fucks up the chemistry yeah. of, the, of the whole locker room when someone leaves. And, especially you know, even if especially someone who's as well-liked as Cassian. To my, to my understanding, Cassian is incredibly well-liked in that locker room. So, like, he would be someone who would get pushed down or out or traded out in that in that deal. That would be a huge shock to the room because, ev- like, he's, he's very popular in that locker room. And, like you say, keep rolling with what's working because the Oilers are currently sitting tied for second in the league with a 750 points percentage. Yeah. And, like, yeah, if, if a guy like Cassian isn't playing, like, he still will be in the locker room and, like, you know, cheering yeah. on the guys and everything. And it's like... Cassian is the guy you need in playoffs. Like you, you need a guy like that. Exactly. And you don't necessarily that's, need a guy that's like that. That's when Jake the DeBrus. entire Oilers arena was cheering Cassian's name against San Jose in that one series. Yeah, like he's a valuable player in playoffs. You don't like Jake DeBrusque. You have other players that can fill that same role. So yeah, I, yeah, I just don't know. Seems like a, a similar to Warren Fogle type. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know where he, where he will end up, but something to keep an eye on for sure. Just kind of, you know, what what teams might uh, might take a take a chance on him. Um, what other random prospect does Vancouver have to give up to trade for DeBrusque? <laughs> oh, I don't <laughs> Seems know. Seems to be the theme. <laughs> somebody. There's, there's surely you somebody. Give up a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they don't have a first-round pick this year, I don't think, so maybe they'll give next year's first-round pick. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's kind of goofy, but um, we'll see who who wants to bring in someone who's you know might might do for a relocation. We saw Sam Bennett fucking explode when he moved to Florida, and he's still doing well. So you know maybe that maybe that's possible. Jake DeBrus too. Maybe he just gets a bit more opportunity and is able to absolutely shine on a new line. And yeah, who knows? So someone will 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 definitely want him. So we'll see. Um you know where he ends up um and then um you know just around the league there's a couple interesting waiver moves so the first of them was matt murray went through waivers for the ottawa senators and that's a tough look (laughs) if that's that's supposed to be your starting goalie don't uh (laughs) yeah don't don't worry though everybody ottawa's rebuild is done as they sit last in the nhl (laughs) yeah and uh murray struggled in pittsburgh and they they bought low and he's still bad so uh, yeah yeah i mean so last season we gave him the benefit of the doubt that you know oh the team sucks so he's not gonna be very good either they gave him some chances this season and it was a lot of the same six games played yeah. like an 890 save percentage 326 goals against average it's yeah, it's it's not good enough. No, yeah, yeah. The team still sucks, but other goalies are not as bad as you. So down to the AHL, get some get some confidence back, and they'll might try them again yeah. down the road. So we'll see. Um, you know what? That could other... be that could be it. You know, a conditioning stint essentially in the AHL, and then bring them up later in the season and see what happens. Maybe the rest of the teams back too, because the Senators had been dealing with a major. Uh, major roster loss from their COVID outbreak, so they'll be returning to the li- to the ice tomorrow, I think. 
Yeah, and you're like no one's gonna claim them at that cost. So, you know, whatever. Um, or never then, mind. The Senators have been playing for a bit, but they're getting more of their roster back for tomorrow's game. Yeah. Um, and then the other waiver move was Evander Kane went went through waivers to the uh, Barracuda. Um, so San Jose put him down to the minors to kind of get him get him some some action. Um, and there's a rumor that San Jose would be willing to to retain 50% of his salary in a trade. Um, and so this has kind of been the, the talking point with him all year is San Jose even going to bring him back. And it looks like right now the the rumor is they don't want to. And I don't blame yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's, I really what's the don't. point? And it's is it, it's not worth it to go shake up the locker room. They seem to be doing a little bit better. They haven't been as good as they did as they started the season lately. But again, like I go back to that rumor from the off season that key players in the Sharks locker room didn't want him back. And mm -hmm. you know, do you, you know, how do you how do you play that off to your to your team when it's like, hey, we're bringing him back anyways? Like that's just gonna piss everyone off if if this is the case, if this rumor is true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's, what, like a 30, 35 goal scorer at his best, so is he going to be at his best? Probably oh, yeah. not. Um, but, I mean, there, there there could be some teams that are willing to take a chance on him um, or at least, you know, get something out of San Jose along with it to take him off their hands. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, Vancouver doesn't have a first-round pick this, season, this uh, upcoming draft, so... You know, <laughs> they, they probably would have chomped at that opportunity. Um, that's one of the rumored spots. I mean, apparently his agent has been talking to some teams, and Vancouver is one of them. So, um, yeah. Which to, I, Mitch, to which my response was, um, if your locker room is fighting with each other, bring in someone that everyone can hate, because then you won't be fighting with each other anymore. Yeah, a common enemy bonds people together, right? There you go. Um, so, yeah, I. I don't know who the hell would want to touch that guy with a 50 foot pole right now. Um, you know, things like faking a COVID <laughs> pass. Like, is he even allowed in Canada yeah. at this point? I know he's a Canadian, but like, is he even going to be able to play <laughs> in Canada? Like, right. Yeah. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes of him? So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just 50% retained is a bit easier pill to swallow, but like, still but yeah that's gonna two, really shake up your locker 2. room 9 million or so yeah that's 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 i don't know it's like it's like almost like chemotherapy for a team right like if you if you have a cancer on your team which is like a broken locker room and you're bringing in like another cancer <laughs> like what <Yeah>. happens <laughs> like you bring another toxic element does it does it kill the other cancer, like you're saying, like a common enemy, or does it just make it totally worse? <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I mean, I maybe he just plays in the AHL if they can't find a Could place for him. Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, you you look at teams that you know what teams don't have a lot to lose right now, and like Arizona's got cap space for days. They could probably get a draft pick out of this arrangement. And hey. you know, they could probably they could probably benefit from someone like him who is actually a good player when he's when he's on. He's you know a twenty plus goal scorer reliably puts up stats in every part of the score sheet. It's someone that they don't the Arizona Coyotes don't really have. I know this probably won't happen, but it'd be interesting if it did. But if someone like Lou Lamarillo decided to bring him in and was like, I'm gonna shape this kid oh, up. God. And then, you know, gets him to shave and oh. gets him to toe the line. I don't know. They, they have had a scoring issue. <laughs> you know what? That'd be, that's an interesting <laughs> destination. It, you know, if, if Lou wants to take on that type of project, you know, we just kind of see how see how that goes when, you know, someone like Josh Hosang kind of gets pushed out of that organization for, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever he did behind the scenes. But um, that'd be an interesting destination. Yeah, like I said, I probably don't think it would happen because I don't think Lou would be like, yeah, that's a guy that I want to bring in. But it's like, well, you, yeah, it's a good player that you could get at a really cheap rate right now if you're willing to take it on. And they're at the bottom yeah. of the Metro, and they do need scoring. So there, I don't think there's a broken room there. It's just 
you know, a weird start to the season, but that and again, we're talking about Cassie and a guy in playoffs. Vander Kane, you know, plays that playoff style. Islanders have, you know, been close but haven't, you know, gotten, you know, the Stanley Cup in recent past. Maybe that's someone they want to bring in just for his play style. I don't know, but or the or Philly. I think he could go he could fit in in Philly. Philly fans would probably love it. <laughs> he, that's that's accurate. He'd have the Philly he'd have the Philly style. And yeah. again, you know, Philly is another team that's really struggling lately with their offense. Um the you know, in a major slump. And yeah, yeah, they don't have a whole lot of cap space at all. I think they're according to cap uh, they have a I think they'd have enough to bring him in with LTIR space. Yeah, who knows? I don't know. He'll, he'll probably go somewhere though or just rot in the AHL, which is fine. Well, that's uh, that's the thing. I mean, he's good at hockey. That's all the teams care about. He'll get another chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Tony D'Angelo, maybe the maybe the Hurricanes. Maybe they'll bring him <laughs> in. Why not? Um they stay still in on Vertanen. <laughs> Hurricanes don't seem to have a problem with morals, so maybe they'll bring in bring in um Vander Kane and maybe make him play D and play with uh, Tony D'Angelo. <laughs> Who knows? That'd be a fun pairing. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah the all ethics line. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, anyway, speaking of the Carolina Hurricanes, Rod Brindamore got fined twenty five k um, for, I believe, essentially just I don't know berating an official or something like that during the the game against the Capitals. Um, officials called a, a five on three minor penalty. In like the last couple of minutes of the game, when Sebastian Aho chopped, um, I think it was Protus's stick, broke it. That's a, that's a game he called. It's called ninety percent of the time. So he was giving it to him. Like the I wasn't watching with audio, um, but uh, he, I could just you know they showed him on camera a lot. He was just giving it to the ref. So um, they ended up losing that game. Um, after a bit of a comeback attempt, they tied the game and then they went went down and the Capitals scored on the on the power play. So, you know, blaming the refs for your players' shitty decision, get a fine. I think the fine money goes towards like some sort of charity though. So, you know, that's that's probably one that the team's like, hey, here's here's twenty five k back into your pocket. Um, but I think that's the first coach that got fined for something like that this season. I remember. I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but Cat, uh, Bruce Cassidy got fined. I think the same amount for, you know, saying that the refs were calling a bad game or something. So, you know, there's a bit of a yeah. You know, there's a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, precedent. Yeah, precedent there. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know what what Brandon really. Did something happen earlier in the game? Like, was he already heated up? Because, like you said, a, a slash to break a stick is a gimme call. So, like, I, I know he's a fiery coach, and he's been fined for, he's been fined for, you know, more inappropriate conduct in his past as a coach. But that can't be the only thing. Like, something has to have happened that pissed him off earlier on, and then that just, like, was the, you know, final straw or whatever. I don't know. Maybe he said something after the game or something that, um... I just watched the game itself, and that's all I saw. Um, but again, I wasn't watching it with um, audio, so maybe there was something that happened that wasn't on camera or something. But from what I can recall, I don't think anything else really happened. I mean, maybe there were some missed calls that they they thought should have been called, and I don't know. But that that slash itself was like pretty pretty obvious. But it was down that's five on three with standard. like two minutes yeah. left, and the team had just came back. It looked like they were pushing to try and, you know, take the lead, but I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so any, you know, basically just a, a heat of the moment, like emotional game. Everyone's fired up, charged up, and his top just completely blew off. <laughs> yeah, and it's like ultimately, like I said, I bet the organization is probably like, yeah, whatever, we'll we'll pay you back. Like, you know, it's it's – People like having a fired up coach. I mean, on this the is bench. also the organization that doesn't want to pay any of its employees or players or anything. So <laughs> and didn't want to sign the rest of the coaches. So maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. That's coming out of the budget that you know we didn't have. So yeah. Um, you don't have you don't have an assistant next year. Sorry, Rod. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. Anyway, that that's the the Hurricanes. But um, one more team I wanted to talk about here was just the Winnipeg Jets and how they've been 
I don't know what's the what's the what's the pun here for jets like fail to take off or <laughs> crash landing or something like that uh, they've fail, just yeah. failure they've just on been, launch <laughs> yeah they've just been not the best um it's kind of been like i don't know i guess the defense isn't really a, a huge issue but like hellebuck has been like letting in like the first shot quite a bit it seems yeah um, um, and um i was gonna ask you about that because winning yeah, all all season, Hellebuck's been off. He's been letting in goals that he wouldn't have in the past. He's been giving up chances or giving up goals in just situations that someone like him usually would have, especially with how good he's been the last couple seasons. And even though he's not doing terrible, um, it's the situation and the timing, the timeliness of his saves is just off. Like you said, he's giving up the goal on the first shots in the first minutes. And like that's that's huge for squashing your team's momentum and you know giving them a, a a chance to win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like Eric Comrie's got a lower goals against average right now, and he's probably played like a complete fraction of the games, but um, a third. Yeah, it's you know Connor Hellbuck sitting at a nine eighteen right now, so it's not like he's been absolutely terrible, but like. He's one no. of the best goalies in the league. You'd expect him at like nine two five at the very least, you know, like nine thirty, something like that, with a few shutouts under his belt. He's he's got zero right now. Um, That's because Jacob Markstrom has all of them so far. Yeah, Markstrom's insane. There's there's a um, set amount. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there can um, only be so many. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know, to to add on to Jets struggling, you look at Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler. Shifley is a consistent point per game guy over his entire career. Basically, he's got eight points in sixteen games, and Blake Wheeler is seventeen seven points in seventeen games. Pardon me. You know, they're yeah. they're sitting there. You know, I've got Evgeny Svechnikov sandwiched between them on the on the Jets score sheet. Yeah, notable player is Evgeny Svechnikov. Um, yeah, it's it's insane. Just the the. I don't know if it's the COVID effect or if there's a, just a crazy drop off for like Blake Wheeler right now, but I don't know if he's a I, if he's a I historical mean, slow starter too. But it's been quiet. Yeah, I mean Wheeler and Shifley were two of the Jets that were sidelined with COVID for a chunk earlier this season, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know we we've seen it with other players like uh, last season with like. The, the Devils, the Sabres, a whole bunch of people, like Mika Zibanejad, where they, they're coming off of a battle with COVID and they are just not the same players. They're behind the play. They're not fully there yet. They don't have the fitness or the, the athleticism back yet. And they just struggle for a while until they finally find their game, you know, halfway into the season. I wonder, you know, that's kind of what we're dealing with here because, you know, luckily in the meantime, like Kyle Connor and Pierre Luc Dubois have been fantastic, and Cop, and and Andrew Cop, yeah, seventeen points in twenty two games for Cop, and eighteen and twenty two for Dubois. So that's just they're they're getting the offense they need from their you know secondary scoring, but they're struggling. They're not getting their primary scoring, and their goaltending isn't holding up either. And I'm pretty sure Hellbuck had COVID late in the summer too. Yeah, they just, just like. The first goal, getting down, and then like their star players, aside from Connor, have just been like you know not Lack not producing luster. as much as they need, um, and that's that's it really. And you know it's it's kind of like that meme where it's like you know um, that that guy like sprinting behind someone catching up. It's like in the rearview mirror. It's like right now that's 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 Colorado right now, <laughs> like they're. They're one point back, but you know, four games in hand. <laughs> like they're 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 coming. Yeah, they're coming for that. Yeah, so that Winnipeg, third Winnipeg spot is there. not very safe because they're you know if we're going by points percentage, they're even behind Nashville. Yeah, like they're and they're Dallas slipping. and Dallas. Like, yeah, I mean they they played the most games Nashville's in that division. In the division. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah, is a so trend they, that has they're to slipping. change very quickly. Yeah, um, four, five, and one in their last ten, um, and they've they've got to turn it around here quick because um, it can get away on them in that 
that competitive division, just how good the Wild have been. Um, you know, they, they need to they need to turn it around and get some of those guys going. And, you know, you, you were saying this before the episode, but, um, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago or whatever, you were talking about Paul Maurice might be on the hot seat in the off season if, if the Jets don't win the Cup. And uh, what about right now? <laughs> right? Like, if the Jets don't turn it around in the next 10 games, you have to imagine that Paul Maurice's seat gets very hot because the Jets are not in a position to waste away another year of their competitive window on this. That they might that might have to be the next change because they don't really need to make a roster move. Mm-hmm. But do they maybe need a different voice in the locker room because this one hasn't gotten them over the hump. This one's been there for a long time and hasn't quite gotten them through everything. Yeah, and this you know when when Patrick Line left, he was he was kind of talking about how like I think I don't know if this was like confirmed or if there was like some sort of like rumor or back channel or something, but he was talking about how like Paul Maurice and Blake Wheeler or Paul Maurice kind of lets Blake Wheeler run the show a bit. And with just how bad Blake Wheeler has been right now and how much ice time he's still getting, it's like you know, Paul Maurice has got to be like, "Okay, Blake." <laughs> like you suck. <laughs> like it's time for us to give the opportunity to, you know, Andrew Cop yeah, on the first power line. play. Like, let's get those guys out there instead of you because you're not doing a great job. Like, just that reluctance to do that. It's like, yeah, you might have to bring in a new guy who just uh, says, yeah, I don't care if you're the captain, Blake. Like, I'm the coach. You're not out there. Yeah. So I could see that happening. You know, if it keeps going on and. Blake Wheeler's, you know, 30 games into the season doesn't have a goal yet or something. It's like, and then he's still getting all that opportunity on the power play. It's like, okay. Yeah, he's still getting 18 to 20 minutes of ice time per game. Yeah, and he's got seven points. And I mean, no goals. Seven points and like one assist in, or two assists in his last nine games or so. And those both came in the same game, I think. Right, exactly. It's both in the Calgary game. Yeah, and I think he's the king of empty net assists right now. <laughs> like all of his all of his points are like empty net goal assists. Oh, so, yeah. um, not even not even productive assists. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, at some point, it's like you got to give the opportunity to the the guys that deserve it. And if he's not deserving it, just you know, bump up the ice time of guys like Cop and Dubois, and you know, see where it goes. But it's definitely a fall off from, you know, Kyle Connor and Dubois and Cop. It's like some other players have got to get 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 it into the next gear here. Yeah. Um. The, you know the the silver lining is that their defense is actually chipping in quite a bit. Um. You know, just kind of across the board almost. Um. But, um, Schmidt has been just a really good addition to that team, and I think Dil- uh, Brendan Dillon. He seems to be fitting defensively. In. Has yeah. been, you know good for clearing around the net and stuff but it's just like man <laughs> i remember our our season preview we, we were talking about how the jets were uh, you know one of our one of our teams to keep an eye on and kind of one of our favorites for the cup and it's they have not looked like it so far you know no no this this version of the jets is a little bit dysfunctional um i i can't remember seeing them this consistently lackluster and just unimpressive for a while and yeah it's <laughs> if they don't turn it around the next 10 games here then they they're pretty much a write-off at this point yeah it's, it's gonna, gonna be tough really to not gonna be able to come back and yeah. that's the thing like you said the division is so competitive that they're currently sitting sixth and they then have to overcome nashville dallas colorado in teams that have just been have been solid in like St. Louis and Minnesota, like St. Louis started the season one of the best teams in the league. Mm-hmm. They've fallen off a bit, but now you've got Minnesota who's up there, and you know Dallas is just consistently hard to beat. They're not very overwhelming, but you know they're they're staying in games. You know, as soon as we record mm-hmm. that episode trashing Dallas's offense, they go and you know they go they go and have a couple of decent games, I think. But yeah. Yeah, they've they've kind of started, and Rupe Hints has been a large part of that. He's just been on fire. Um, yeah, and like Nashville, like they got Philip Forsberg back, and that guy's been a scoring machine. Like he's got two goals tonight. I think he had t- like a two goals in his return. Like he's just been lighting it up. Um, 
And so, yeah, like, I don't know. It's, it's got to, it's got to shake it up real quick if they want to, you know, stay in the hunt there because, you know, those teams are going to start getting their, their wins when they can. So, Jets got to do the same. That wraps things up for this time here on Clappercast. Make sure you rate and review this episode and toss a follow or subscribe our way. For more content, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Clappercast Media or on Twitter at Clappercast. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll be back next week with more hockey talk.